All Saints Episcopal Church made a dramatic move to the far west end in 1958. In 2001, a collection of color slides was discovered. Assistant Rector Tom Simmons. Coincidentally, I was working on a project restoring pieces of stained glass windows from the old church on Franklin Street, which are in our basement here, when the slides were found in a closet upstairs. These slides give us the opportunity to look at the past of All Saints Church and from there to look at our present and future. I'll show you the past in these color slides taken in the mid-50s. They document the life of All Saints when the church was located on the 300 block of West Franklin Street in Richmond. These slides make it possible for us to view our present time and location here on River Road at the beginning of the 21st century and the future that we are stepping into every day in a whole new light. For those of you who remember the old church, this will be a trip down memory lane, but always with an eye to the future because the past is always changed by the present and yet it still guides us into the future. We'll begin with a short summary of the history of All Saints Church. In the 1880s, Richmond was a city in transition. 20 years after the Civil War, Richmond was a growing city with new industry and wealth. It was also a time of religious revival that had begun in the Confederate armies during the war. With the city population steadily moving westward, the old monumental church on Broad Street, just before it dips down into the bottom, bought a house at the corner of Madison and Grace in what was then the west end of Richmond. They called it the Monumental Chapel. In 1883, four vestrymen from Monumental, Peter Mayo, James Boyd, Thomas Alfred, and Thomas Atkinson, bought the chapel and formed a new parish. They called it All Saints. The Reverend Robert Olton was the fourth rector of All Saints Church, serving from 1946 to 1965. There is a a solidity of purpose and intent for the future. And uh, this is the great thing that all saints had. They had a purpose. And I think it's a wham-bam, damn good uh, picture of the nature of all saints congregation. And they chose to name the church All Saints. But I do think it is uh, the characteristic of all saints that they have this... uh, knowledge of where they came from and this purposefulness as they face the future. Before long, they decided to build a proper church next door on Madison Street between Grace and Franklin. It was completed in 1888. Their first liturgy in the new building with their new rector, John Yates Downman, with Bishop Whittle was Christmas morning of that year. The congregation numbered approximately 30 people. But it grew rapidly. After seven years, the vestry grew to 12 members, and by 1898, 10 years after its founding, the Congregation of All Saints had grown tenfold, 300 members. In that year, they decided to build again. The cornerstone of the new church was laid right next door at the corner of Madison and Franklin Streets. All Saints Church now occupied the entire block of Madison Street from Grace to Franklin. The new building was completed in 1901, and the first liturgy was celebrated on the Feast of the Epiphany. And this is the church they built, with the most magnificent Gothic tower in Richmond. Cliff Fleet remembers going up in that tower. Once a month we'd go up there. You'd go up in the balcony, and then there was a trap door you'd go through and up up the ladder. It was a beautiful view looking down towards the Jefferson and downtown. And there were lots of pigeons. (laughs) But, um... It really was fun going up there, and probably because we weren't supposed to. Peter Mayo, senior warden until his death in 1920, provided the lot, the altar, an altar rail, the organ, the Te Deum windows above the altar, and the general stained glass, which we now call the common glaze windows throughout the church. All Saints was obviously home to some of the very wealthy families of Richmond, surrounded by some of the finest ecclesiastical art in the whole city. These Episcopalians gathered to worship in a beautiful place, and they served their Lord quietly and faithfully in a city of 85,000 people and a world 
in which most people walked to church. Women didn't vote, and the United States was just beginning to assert itself on the world stage. They built a church for the 20th century, 101 years ago. It was made in the very traditional French Gothic architecture, and yet it had some of the latest cutting-edge artistic technology in its Tiffany windows. It was one of the first electrically lighted buildings in the city of Richmond. In 1920, All Saints published its first newsletter, the precursor to the Dove, and in 1930, they staged their first Christmas pageant. And in 1940, the last of the first generation of All Saints leaders died. On February 1st, Frederick Valentine, who had served on the vestry since 1895, died as senior warden. A generation had passed. In the 40s, things began to change rapidly in the world and at All Saints Church. Soon, the USA would enter World War II. At All Saints, two notable new developments came to pass. The new rector, the Reverend James Kennedy, took to the radio with a daily devotional program called Haven and even had Sunday liturgies broadcast. More significantly, in 1942, at the congregational meeting in April, the system of rotating vestries was adopted. It ended the system of perpetual vestrymen and vestry officers by which the original founders had exercised control for a year shy of 60 years. Valentine was succeeded as senior warden by Otis Alfred, the son of one of the original founders, Thomas Alfred. Otis Alfred had served as treasurer of the parish for 27 years and was succeeded in that post by Gordon Miller Sr., father of our own Gordon Miller and grandfather to Lanny Miller, whom All Saints currently supports as a missionary in East Asia. There's a lot of history here that we are connected to and familiar with still today. To me, the choir was an experience that one would really never forget. If you've never sang in the choir, you've missed an experience. I, I tease Charlie a lot about uh, the disciplinarian that he was, or maybe still is, but we couldn't look at it in the congregation. We had to look straight ahead, and he used the mirrors to watch us. In the downtown church, the, the choir room was dark with linoleum floors. We sat on church pews in the, in the practice room, and he had an old piano that he used. On holidays or festive occasions when we used uh, the choir to come down the side aisles and back up the center, the choir would go behind the chancel and behind the altar where nobody could see them. Ed Rhodes says he never forgot what he learned as an All Saints choir boy. Dr. Cliff Fleet, now a member of the vestry, joined the choir as an eight-year-old. That's him, second from the right. Charlie Cook was organist and choir master when All Saints moved. The now traditional festival of lessons and carols began in the present church. For years, Olivet to Calvary was the choir's major presentation performed on Good Friday. And Todd has really have fallen into disfavor. People don't, Sam Pryor don't want to come to them anymore. And I did it until I retired. And Andy did it for two or three more years, I believe. I came back and played one of them. And it's, it's considered Victorian music, which it seems to be coming back now, but it's all out of, out of favor with uh, musicians. These pictures were taken of All Saints Episcopal Church during the mid-50s. There is a lot here that is familiar to us now in the year 2002, and yet times were changing. The city of Richmond was growing rapidly westward, and the suburbs were springing up where farmland had been. Episcopalians were moving from the city to the wealthy suburbs like Windsor Farms, Moreland, and Tuckahoe. Folks who once walked a few blocks to worship at All Saints were now driving miles to come back to Franklin Street. There were several reasons to move. Bob Olton, the fourth rector of All Saints, remembers what the old building was like. The congregation was faced with many repairs 
to the old building, for example, the, the leaky roof and the struggle we had to keep the pews uh, clean. Everybody down below got dusted with the soot, and when it rained, you could hear the water dripping in different areas. A service might be accompanied not only by the organ, but by the dropping of rain through the roof into buckets and pans. If the church had decided to remain in its location, there would have been no escaping heavy renovation costs, crippling lack of parking, and a dearth of little children. The official history of All Saints, written in 1958 by parish secretary Jenny Hughes, summarized the church's response. She said, All Saints was one of three Episcopal churches within a radius of a few blocks, the others being St. James in Grace and Holy Trinity. Therefore, it was deemed advisable to move further west where the city was growing so rapidly. Roberta Gale Boyles remembers Miss Jenny and all she did for the church that she loved. One of her pet projects was the Christmas pageant. And it seems funny now, but all the little girls had to cover their heads to go into the church. And if you didn't have anything else, you could put a Kleenex or a handkerchief, whatever. But you were not allowed to go in the church with Miss Jenny without your head covered. At the congregational meeting on April 12, 1955, a majority of the church voted to move from its location on Franklin Street to our present location here on the property of Roslyn. The cornerstone was laid on October 27, 1957, along with the cornerstone of the Franklin Street Church dated 1898. These stones were laid just three weeks after Sputnik orbited the Earth. Bob Olton remembers the groundbreaking ceremony. At the breaking of the ground service for the new church, Bishop Gibson, Robert Gibson, did not dig up a piece of ground with a shovel or a hoe. He used a bulldozer, and uh, it was quite a sensation. <laughs> Andy Fairbank is still a regular at All Saints Church. I was on the vestry when we moved, and the thing was that the congregation in downtown was getting smaller and smaller, and very few children, and they had to move to, to save ourselves. And we came out here, and the church looked so short. It wasn't tall enough. On the ceiling, it was different design. But a lot of people didn't, didn't like that seal, but it turned out pretty good. The last service at Franklin Street was Easter 1958. Three years later, after searching in vain for another congregation to buy the old church building, All Saints sold the Franklin Street Church to a Richmond developer for $85,000. In November of 1961, the building was demolished to make room for the Berkshire, a high-rise apartment building. It was a new city and a new world. Richmond had tripled in size to 360,000. There was a stylish young president of the USA, the first of a new generation. The civil rights movement was gathering momentum and secularization was too, from the Supreme Court to county courthouses all over the nation. In Richmond, a French Gothic landmark was demolished to make room for a high-rise, low-cost apartment building. It was truly a symbolic end of Christendom in the capital of our commonwealth. Bob Olton remembers what it was like. There was a deconsecration service in the practically empty building, which Bishop Goodwin and I and a half a dozen parishioners withdrew the consecration. It was really a death experience. And uh, the new church was the resurrection experience, is the way I looked at it. It was very painful for people to give it up, and I hated to leave it. The future was unknown and unpredictable. This uh, rebirth of a dying city center parish was uh, Good Friday and Easter combined. But this end was simply a new beginning. Out of the death of the old church came the birth of the new church here on River Road and the 40-plus years of life and ministry and growth that we've enjoyed in the far west end. As the booklet, entitled Answering the Call, published to support the capital campaign for the move from Franklin Street, stated, Here, a fine old church with the experience and heritage of several generations moves into a great suburban area, developing at a tremendous rate, burgeoning with new homes and children. It was an explosive situation that we moved into, and it was a, a challenge uh, to grow and expand and anticipate and look to the future 
that came to the congregation. They really responded to it in a marvelous way. That's the past, and the present is all around us. We are still answering the call. We have carried the past with us. The cross and chalices we use for communion in the narthex are from the original monumental church. The font, lectern, and altar book rest came from the first church built in 1888. So here we are, the current incarnation of All Saints Church. At the end of 119 years of history, if we count to the founding of All Saints, or 184 years of history, if we count to the beginning of the monumental church, we certainly bear the family resemblance. Much of the art around us came here from the Franklin Street Church. But as the building committee reported in 1956, the condition and size of many of these windows makes it most impractical to move them into the new church. For most of them, it was all they could do to remove them from the old building and place them in our basement, which is where they are now, having not seen the light of day for more than 40 years. We have carried the past with us, and in the process, we have transformed it. That's the way it always works. The past lives with us in the present, but is transformed by it. The past is the past, and you can say all kinds of nice things about how great it is to be associated with a group of people that have this kind of purpose, and that with this kind of relationship with one another and the anticipation and expectation of the future. We still carry the All Saints DNA after all these years. The missionary move westward that began in the mid-19th century continues today. In the early 1990s, when Christ Church was being planted, All Saints provided a piece of land vital to its founding. Much as the monumental church gave All Saints a helping hand in the 1880s. In the first years of this new century, members of All Saints have composed the bulk of a core group launch team for the church plant in eastern Goochland County, recently named St. Francis Church. And in the next few years, our congregation will be called upon to aid in planting another church in western Henrico County. I sometimes wonder what those original founders would think if they could see us now. Peter Mayo would certainly recognize the baptismal font in our narthex, for it was dedicated to the memory of Nathaniel, his 17-month-old son who died in the year 1865. Above that font is a window dedicated by Andy and Margaret Fairbank to their son Drew, who passed away 99 years later in 1964. These are the folks who have come before us. In working for the future, they have created the present that we enjoy. And we are doing the same thing for those who will come after us. Old All Saints was built 101 years ago. I wonder what our descendants in this place 101 years from now will be like. How will the world change between now and then, and how will they respond? How will what is present for us, our decisions, our faithfulness and lifestyle, our stewardship as Christians in this place, impact their life? As we look to the past, it shapes our present and makes us think of the future. As Bob Alton said in his letter dated March 28, 1956, written to encourage support for this great endeavor, the building of the church in which we now worship. Bob said, the memories of a great past compel us to serve the future.